Okay. So welcome, guys, again to this Wednesday's teaching from the Ortho FRCS Mentor Group. Thank you all for joining. Uh, tonight we have only one presentation. Uh, the theme is trauma and will be presented by Athar. And uh, we have Shwan uh, uh, um, supervising the session also. Uh, please uh, feel free to pop up your questions uh, through the chat uh, box and uh, raise the hand uh, symbol next to your name if you want to talk. And also there will be an extended uh, hot seat session after. So please ex start expressing your interest from now, if you would like to join. Um, can, before, can, before, can everybody just, see my screen? Yeah. Just before, could we again give priority to the guys who are sitting the exam in uh, April? Um, yeah. So whoever's sitting the exam in April, please put your hands up for it. If not enough people are volunteering, then we'll move to the guys who are sitting in June. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I think that's a very valid point. Good. Okay. Everybody see everything? Yeah. Okay. Now, okay guys, so today's topic is trauma. Yes, trauma is, uh, is not an alien to us. And uh, trauma is, is, probably, is probably what everyone knows. Over here, you should consider, all of you should consider this station as a gift. But be careful because that gift comes with a price and that price is they are not expecting anything less than a tutorial here so once a trauma situation has been thrown to you they expect you to know everything because they are expecting you to to come in having trauma as the best ammunition of yours you know trauma in your armory and you should be throwing references you should be throwing you should be teaching them because last time they read trauma was probably when they have given exams and for them to be an examiner they have to be at least seven year consultant so that we are talking for a normal uh, trainee at least 10 years before he comes unless they are trauma surgeons and if they're trauma surgeons they're unlikely taking trauma exam anyways now, as I always say to you in my previous talks as well, you have to be, you know, I, I invented this term, psychiatrist traumatologist. So you have to be a mini psychiatrist in your head. So you need to know what the examiner wants you to say. And that's, I cannot teach you. You just have this intuition built into you for you to say, you know, whether this examiner wants me to say A, B, C, D, E for every question, or whether this examiner wants me to just press on the accelerator and get on with things. I tell you what, the examiners what I have been known and examiners what I've been around or examiner what I have seen generally likes you to just get on with it. There are very few old dogs there that wants you to say a, B, C, D, E first before you embark on to the actual topic because five minutes are very less. So remember, you are a psychiatrist traumatologist. So the minute you sit on that hot seat and you see your two examiner start judging from their facial expressions, whatever you get, that whether they are happy with the way you are proceeding or you need to slow down or you need to fasten up a bit. Now, it's a driving test. So apart from driving, everything else will be checked. The same is true for trauma. They know you know how to fix an ankle. They know you know how to do a hemi. So they are not testing that. They just want you to be a safe surgeon who knows all the practicality and, uh, and controversies around a particular topic. Again, remember buzzwords, remember controversies. There are few words you need to say before you start that will diffuse the situation. Once you diffuse the situation, you then be able to take control and then you will enjoy the rest of your station. If you don't diffuse it early enough, like we do, we keep on asking the same question, the station will not move forward and that will be a very long five minutes 
for that particular scenario. Okay, let's just move forward, guys. Enough of this pep talk. I think, uh, Arthur, just to say, this talk you said is extremely important. It's possibly as important as knowing the subject is. Exactly. It's having the right approach, which you described now. So I, I thank you very much for this introduction. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for support. Now, like everything in the exam, I can predict sitting here 90% of the exam. Most of you will predict sitting here almost 90% of the exams. If anything will come in your trauma session, it will be this. You know, this x-ray, what you can see on your screen. It will be an open book fracture, okay? It will be in a situation where patient will having a hypotension and all the other parameters of circulatory compromise and you just have to rattle things out. You need to give that guy a tutorial. You need to talk about all the buzzwords that can come into your head. Permissive hypotension, damage control orthopedics, transanamic acid, pelvic binder. We will go through it all the, in a systemically way, but that's what is, should be clouding your mind and you should then start rattling it out, okay? So that's, that is going to, if in a trauma situation, this pelvis is what you're going to see and you, know, you all know what it is. Anything that has got a Bose guideline, anything that has got a Bose guideline, you need to read that. They are not exhaustive. There are 14 of them and, and you just need to read it. There are no two ways about it. You're sitting the most important exam in your life. Why would you not know those 14 pages? There is no excuse for it. If you keep on repeating it, they keep on saying to you, they are not interested, they are guidelines, but they expect you to know. So Bose guidelines for pelvic trauma, I have copy pasted it from the Bose um, this thing, and you all have resource to it. Again, it's all new, it's, uh, it's all normal, it's all known to you. There is nothing I'm teaching which is not known. So in a standard practice audit, what are, is suspected? You, you suspect an active bleed if you see this pelvic fracture and you start from ATLS, they'll say airway breathing is fine, cervical spine immobilization, they'll say it's fine. You go straight onto the pelvis, you apply a pelvic binder in the correct position. It is that x-ray which is there and there is another x-ray with pelvic binder right at the abdomen. And then you need to comment on the pelvic binder as well and you need to say the pelvic binder maybe is not in a correct position. If you are going for gold, then you can say things, you will internally rotate the leg and all the rest, but these are minutiae. But you need to know where the pelvic binder goes. You need to familiarize yourself with a pelvic binder. It's a yellow color thing. It goes on the GT. That's what you need to say. That should come out of your mouth. Yes. And, all, and if you don't know it, don't go for the exam. Okay. Please take my words. Now, hemodynamic stability, you need to know about the major trauma center, MTC. It is, it is, it is the first page in Banaskovich. You need to know about MTC. You need to know about when this uh, uh, TRAN network being set up and who runs it. So, so I'm not going to teach you. You need to go read that page. Transanamic acid. Okay. You need to know the mechanism of action. You need to know the first clot and you need to know why we give transanamic acid. Okay. You need to know crash one and crash two trials. Crash one, you just need to know the name. Yeah, you know, it may sound very complicated, but in a trauma setting, if you're not going to say crash one, crash two style, you are doing injustice to yourself. Okay, you need to, you need to say these words. They are not, they are not stranger to you. You have heard it thousands of times. So when you see that open book pelvis fracture in, the, in your exam, if transanamic acid is not coming out of your mouth, it's crash one, crash two trial is not coming up from your mouth, you're doing injustice to yourself, okay? Then, scanogram. Remember scanogram. Remember CT with contrast. Yes? Remember what will you do if the patient continues to go downhill? So remember those four types of patient, responders, transient responders, and non-responders. Remember that. You have to have a strict protocol when you should ring the alarm bell 
for major transfusion protocol. Then you need to know PAC1 and PAC2. And you need to know, as per your trust, you can go and ask in the a &E what PAC1 contains and what PAC2 contains. Generally, there are equal amount of fresh frozen plasma platelets and RCC, but every trust have got their own. You go talk to them and regurgitate the same thing in the exam. Even if you make it up, even if you say what written in the Panaskovich, that's it. That's what you need to say. That's what you need to say. Okay. Now, you need to have a clear protocol for binder removal as well. You should not leave it beyond 24 hours because what will it do? It will be counterproductive. Okay. And the clot should have formed by then. And if it's not forming, the patient wouldn't be alive. Okay. So that's, that's another thing you should be remembering. You need to get the trauma team, the general surgeon on board. If it's non-responder, you need to know how the pelvic packing can be done. And you need to know the, um, you need to know what, how to reassess, how to reassess. And you need to know something about the psycho, psychological, physical, and neurological disabilities and when to put catheter. And just be wary of that. By the time you have regurgitated all these things, I think you are on a safe pathway. You have diffused the situation. The examiner is now enjoying the conversation, what you are having, and you can get on with things. Even if you say something wrong, it's, it's going to be discarded because you have diffused the situation by bringing the Bose guidelines in, by getting him back to his chair. Once you see him going back to his chair, that's it. You have diffused the situation and now you can, you can start playing left, right and center, however way you want to. The background is of all this TRAN network setting is started from 1960s where high complication rates with immediate surgery was done. It was due to old methods, poor trauma coordination and ITU support. So delay in treatment, traction in interim leads to pulmonary GI skin, soft tissue problems, stiff joints, prolonged rehab, longer ICU stay, longer quality of life, a lesser quality of life improvement following a major trauma. But this has now changed. The TRAN network has changed it all. Now, so what you do, you split the trauma patients into four. You need to know which one is for damage control <laughs> orthopedics and which one is for early total care. You need to know stable, borderline, unstable, and extremities patient, and then you divide. Remember this, two diagrams, okay? One is how do you do the coagulation test within that so that you know that the clot can maintain and retain. And remember this triad of death in, in trauma setting. It's hypothermia, coagulopathy, and metabolic acidosis. This is not a stranger to any of us. This is not a stranger to any of us. Okay, you should know about it and you should know about how each of this is leading to, leading to, uh, uh, to the problem, how each of this is leading to the problem. So you, you need to know about the mechanism of infection, how hypothermia uh, uh, deranged platelets, how coagulopathy does it, and what lactic acidosis affect us. I'm not going to teach you that. Okay, there is enough to say. Remember, I said, remember the buzzwords. Remember the buzzwords. At present, suspected polytrauma, MTC, trauma triad of death, compensation of blood loss, major transfusion protocol, stopping blood loss, permissive hypertension, hemostatic resuscitation, damage control orthopedics, and why crystalloids and colloids should be avoided? Because there is a risk of loss of first clot. Remember first clot. First clot is another buzzword. Okay, we shed some more light on damage control orthopedics. What is damage control orthopedics? So initially, when uh, when patient were used to be taken to theater straight on, they used to get a phenomena which is called second hit. That that you you try to overcome that phenomena by giving a lot of fluids to the patient. That fluids leak in the in in the chest and give patient ARDS, which is detrimental to their further rehab and it doesn't do uh, the patient doesn't do well 
So remember, remember something about, about damage control orthopedics. Remember what you need to do as soon as you see the patient. So remember the controversy begin with the CT scan and the fast scan. Whether the CT, the CT scan, what both suggest, you need to say that. CT scan with intravenous contrast from head to mid thigh is the best investigation. CT scan, intravenous contrast, head to mid thigh. Then you say in casualty, people can do fast scan. It's quick. And it, can, and it can tell you whether the patient is bleeding in abdomen or chest. But you need to know the CT scanogram and CT scan with contrast head to mid thigh. Once you say that, they know what you're talking about. Okay? They know what you're talking about. If there is any malalignment you see in any long bone, reduce it. That's your cattle of fish. That's you should know. Any, what you do, what is the immediate management of a malaligned bone in any reduce it splint it re-x-ray it yes if you can't reduce it you put it under traction okay that's what it is now damage control orthopedics is again you need to re keep on reassessing 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 how would you reassess you reassess with venous lactate you reassess with their systolic blood pressure you reassess over next few days and you see whether the patient can be then taken to surgery or not now there are few things what you need to remember here the buzzwords are hemodynamically stable no hypoxemia or hypercapnia and serum lactate of less than two millimoles per liter normal coagulation normothermia and normal renal function what is a normal renal function you know that it's less than it's more than one mil per kg per hour for adults for kids is different it's probably 0.5 i don't know it but i remember it for adults you more than likely be facing adult trauma so one mil per kg per hour what is a normal lactate where you can operate it's less than two safe and proceed with definitive surgery if it's less than two you know about hypoxemia and hypercapnia, and you are not stranger to systolic blood pressure. It's 90 is the magic word. Remember 90, 90 millimeter of mercury is the magic word. Okay, now shed some light on venous lactate because venous lactate is, is again, it's one of the controversies. Now we have talked about buzzwords. Now we are coming about the controversies in this particular topic. So venous lactate is, is because there, there is confusion in venous lactate. If it's less than two millimoles per, per liter, it's safe to proceed. If it's more than 2.5, then you need to continue recess in ITU. Yes, so, but there is a gap of 0.5 between two and up and 2.5. So what would you do if it's between two and 2.5? So there are various studies and they're all originating from Gionidas in Leeds that they are saying observe for trend. Now this is the gray area. They like to touch it. If you're doing well, they like to touch the gray area. They like to stretch you. And this is where you are going to say, yes, I am the master. I know about two and 2.5. I will look at the trend. I look at the trend because that bit you remember, if it's less than two, you proceed with surgery. If it's more than 2.5, you stop, you observe the patient in ITU. What will you do in the middle? You look at the trend. You see if it's going down or if it's going up. If it's going up, you should not proceed. Okay. So that's the long and short of it. I think that's, that's what you need to know. You don't need to know the classification of pelvic fracture. You don't need to know anything because that's not the that's not what the scenario is all about it's all about it's all about what what you need to say about atls about taking control of the situation about coming up with the buzzwords i hope you will remember some buzzwords you remember trend you remember permissive hypertension you remember first clot you remember these damage control orthopedics and you remember hemodynamically stable patient assessing and all the rest and obviously coglopathy and the stride of death. Okay, guys, I think I'm up.
Shall we do open fracture as well, or you guys have enough? Yeah, thank you, Athar. Um, it depends on. Um, we haven't had enough. Now it's very interesting talk. And we uh, can, how, how much time do we have? We can go. We on. have. We have. Um, um, about just over five minutes. Okay, so we'll we'll quickly go open fracture because open fracture comes in the same setting, guys. So open fracture again. Open fracture comes in the same setting. Open fracture is not stranger to you, uh, to you, and open fracture has got a board Bose guidelines attached to it. So you cannot screw it up. If this comes, expect no less than a tutorial. They are not expecting any less than a tutorial. You need to say, 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 talk, talk, talk. If I ask someone, hot seat, open fracture, if he let me talk for more than 30 seconds in that particular scenario, that's it. I think he's doing injustice to himself and he's not even scoring passing marks. Remember the buzzwords. The minute the open fracture comes, you need to say trauma network, you need to say orthoplastic, you need to say IV antibiotics. Remember the timing for IV antibiotics. The timing for IV antibiotics in the Bose guidelines is one hour. Don't confuse yourself, okay? It's one hour from their arrival in a &E, okay? It's there, it's there on the Bose guidelines. Don't say 30 minutes, don't say 45 minutes, don't say in the ambulance, don't say outside the ambulance. One hour, one hour, okay? That's what you need to say. Remember it, it's in the Bose guidelines. It's not been made up. It's on black and white. Say one hour, be safe, quote a paper if they challenge you. And that paper is Bose guidelines, okay? Remember to document neurovascular status, okay? Once you document neurovascular status, you need to be clear about and specific. If it's forearm, you need to be specific about documenting all three nerves, okay? And their subdivisions. Radial, ulnar, median, PIN, AIN. You need, if it's leg, you repeat the same. Once you aligned it and splint it, <coughs> excuse me, repeat the neurovascular structure. I uh, repeat the neurovascular status and again document it. These are all legal documents. You are not safe if you're not saying these words. Yes, and it's all part of, it's all part of Bose guidelines. Again, if it's a part of, if it's gastrilo in 3C, if it's arterial injury, then you need to call CT, you need to get a CT angiogram. You need to see if there is any bleeding loose ends. You need to do a trauma scan and you need to do a limb CT as well to delineate further anatomy and for further planning. Okay, so when it comes to CT, if it's arterial injury, remember saying angiogram. Okay, and remember scanogram. Scanogram is another buzzword, and scanogram is head to mid thigh, and it's one scout on AP1 on lateral. It will give you most of the information. Remember that. Now, when you see an open fracture, there are two types. One, uh, so so not two types of contamination. One is very dirty contamination, and dirty contamination includes sewage, marine farmyard wounds, they go to theater straight on. They cannot wait, okay? They go to theater straight on and they get in a, a, a rapid sequence anesthesia. Everything else, you clear the obvious dirt, you take photograph, you put, an, you put a saline soak gauze and remember you put a clear film on it. You're not gonna say anything, anything other than what it's written in the Bose guidelines. You read the Bose guidelines and you regurgitate it. It says clear dressing, avoid mini washouts, put saline soak gauze, okay? Take photographs and if you're not the trauma unit, involve the trauma unit, okay? Remember in a trauma setting, in an open fr fracture setting, remember um, uh, this thing, uh, a fasciotomy. So remember, uh, remember compartment syndrome. A high index of suspicion for compartment syndrome should be there. Once debridement is carried out, patient stabilized, you have splinted it, uh, you need to have a plan for a definitive surgery within 72 hours, orthoplastic care. 
orthoplastic care again orthoplastic care what is the controversy here the controversy here is limb injury severity score remember that and remember if there is an amputation required there are it is not a decision to be taken lightly you need two consultants you need to know there are strict um, indications for amputation you need to just skim through all this if an amputation is required you need to have a a injury severity score pattern whether it's uh, miss or whether it's uh, uh, injury severity score or or whatever whatever you you find easy to remember just get that pattern and uh, studies have shown repeatedly repeatedly that early amputation and rehab gives good quality of life improvement uh, than delaying it delaying it by doing surgeries and and then so that's why the trauma network the tran and orthoplastic cover is so important <coughs> so picture cover plan is what i'm going to say <coughs> sorry i'm i'm running out of gas here now so i think i'm going to stop okay great great <coughs> um, thank you thank you athar i think we um really i can't really add much to what you said we can't teach trauma okay. it's really about teaching the approach to how you answer the question and, and you know that's all the first slide is going to say that yeah. those words I, I wanted just to highlight here in the trauma tables unlike any other table both guidelines are part of your initial answer not don't come at, they don't come at the end please okay don't save the post guideline to the end straight away open fracture your first sentence i will manage this patient according to the post guidelines pelvic fracture the same radius fracture supracondylar fracture straight away you say the first sentence manage the patient according to the post guidelines okay please yeah. and the, the top mark come for mentioning trials, the crash trials, profile trial, any any trial that's related to trauma that comes later on. But both guidelines come in your initial answer. Um, I, one caveat to mention both uh, early on is don't get it wrong. Yes. Once, yeah. you, once you quote it, you need to be precise in what it says, okay? There's, um, you, know, you have to know good, by heart, yeah. I would advise you all not just to read your BOST guidelines, but actually divide the recommendations into A&E management, ward management, theatre management, and post-operative management, uh, and split them up and put them there so it's easier for you to remember them, and also it's easier for you to put them under those headings. I think that's that's uh, great. Thank you, Shwan. We, we, um, there was one question about how was the definition of polytrauma, and um, Shwan has answered it on the chat. I don't know if you want you want to expand a little bit on that for. Uh, so the the problem is the terminology polytrauma um, try, uh, is problematic. So not uh, everyone uses that term. So what they tend to use is the multiply injured patient. If you take a look at uh, the TARN uh, network, it's uh, trauma audit and research network they actually have a number of uh, resources and definitions on that including the injury severity score and the modified injury severity score um, and they show if you go through that because a lot of a lot of you guys are working in a D dgh hospitals as opposed to mtc so you won't have the experience of how these things are scored and even if you do work in an mtc it's often done by special admin people that are uh, hired specifically to make sure all this data is very accurate um, the knowing a little bit about them, so there's an even about about us tab, is worthwhile um, because uh, it shows you where the direction of uh, trauma research and trauma MTCs are going to go down the line. And then yeah. after, uh, we have uh, just to introduce Tamir here. He's one of the mentors also, and um, he is supervising also tonight. So welcome, Tamir. Thanks. Thanks, uh, and uh, the, author, the presentation is very, very uh, good. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. Well done, I think I think there is nothing to teach here. That's why I kept it. I kept it 
open. Yeah, that's yeah. the good thing. You're just to the point, bullets, rather than saying things that they know already. Which is yeah. good. There are people. Um, I think in, in, in a trauma, guys, you'll be surprised that um, candidates quite frequently fail in the trauma station. Yes, exactly. Because expectations are very high. So please uh, take the trauma station very seriously. I, I know you guys, you are all excellent in trauma, but um, take this station very seriously in terms of what you say. So someone so, uh, just, just question, ju someone just asked that Bose guidelines for open fracture did not mention anything about type of antibiotics. It is mentioned. Yeah. He's it is mentioned. About that yeah, one, it's I think. very specific. Yeah, it's very specific. Please, if you don't know the guidelines by heart, don't mention them. But uh, I, my advice is you should know them and you should... You should I think, uh, I think so, you guys. There's a new BOST guideline yeah. for open factor. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I think they have changed the uh, open okay. factor. They have changed. They, they have changed. There is a new one, so you need to you need to know that the, the, they have even mentioned even mentioned what to be given if patient is allergic to cefuroxin or penicillin. So it's all there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll we'll finish. We'll end this um, presentation now. This session, and uh, I will post another link to join the hot seat session. Okay. So please, guys, uh, stay with us and rejoin. Another link will be posted in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking part. Thanks, Athar, Shwan, and Tamir also. Uh, we'll, we'll see you br briefly.